Hello, good morning. My name is Patty Tor Torsney, and I'm the uh, permanent observer for the Interparliamentary Union here at the United Nations. And I'm pleased to introduce to you today our three speakers. Um, the President of the Interparliamentary Union, Sabera Chaudhry, who's a member of parliament from Bangladesh since 1996. Mar Martin Changong, who is our Secretary General based in Geneva, and um, who will talk about the overall activities of the IPU uh, on the Sustainable Development Goals. And the wonderful Petra Baer, who's an Austrian MP and the uh, Chair of the Subcommittee for Development Cooperation. And she, of course, is a 15-year veteran. Um, I'll start with you, uh, President, if you could talk about the DACA communique and our activities here at the HLPF. Thank you very much, Betty, and a very good morning and a warm welcome to all of you. Um, the Interparliamentary Union, as you know, is the global organization of national parliaments. As of date, our membership stands at 173 national parliaments, and we have about 45,000 MPs who represent around 6.5 billion people across the globe. Now, the SDGs, uh, this is an agenda that we have been actively involved in, in terms of articulating the agenda, shaping the agenda, uh, bringing in the dimension of parliamentarians from all over the world into the final formulation of the SDGs. Uh, what we are going to talk about today is, in fact, uh, what we refer to as the Dhaka Communique on redressing inequalities delivering on dignity and well-being for all. Uh, and as you know, the problem of inequality is not new. It has been with us for decades. And various uh, initiatives have been taken at the national level to respond to this. And parliaments have also been involved. But for the first time during the course of the assembly in Dhaka, Bangladesh, which was the 136th assembly, the IPU has actually engaged in this very important subject. So this is the first time that the global organization of national parliaments has, in fact, engaged in the issue on in, of inequality. And during the course of that assembly in Dhaka, there were about 135 national parliaments uh, who were represented. We had close to 1,000 parliamentarians who were there. So very robust debate. And based on the debate, based on practices from around the globe that parliaments were able to share with us, we put together the Dhaka communique. And so this is a direct response to goal 10 of the SDGs in particular and the sustainable development goals as a whole. So this is really what parliaments had to say about this particular um, uh, agenda. Now, I will just share with you four very key points out of the Dhaka communique. I'm not going to read it out. The copies are available, and I welcome you to go through those. The first point is that unless, unless we are able to reverse the trend of growing inequality, we will fail to achieve the SDGs. So a very fundamental point in achieving the SDGs is going to be not only to stop, but to reverse the growing trend of inequality, whether that is social, political, or economic. And of course, that begins with goal one, which is poverty eradication. And I think what was uh, quite refreshing about the communique and the discussions in Dhaka is that if you look at the, the contemporary uh, discussions and the discourse, uh, we have focused in the past on addressing symptoms rather than the disease of poverty. So instead of looking at uh, poverty alleviation by itself, try to look at the underlying causes, the structural causes that actually promote poverty. So this is something that featured very prominently in the communique. And um, so the, it is also not just an economic issue when we talk about inequality. It is also a political issue. And of course, it's very appropriate that we are giving this briefing during the high-level political forum here in New York. Um, and we also feel that in the communique, what we have brought out very strongly, it, it has to do with the distribution of power in our society and how people are represented in politics, how their voices are heard in politics. And uh, so unless we are able to have an inclusive political structure in the countries concerned, there will be voices that are left behind. So this is something which is very, very important. And as we know, inequalities globally are growing. Uh, now we have a situation where eight people own more than half the wealth of the world. So this is actually getting worse. 
And so it goes back to the basic point that unless we are able to reverse the trend, SDGs are going to be a mirage and not going to be achieved. Um, the third key message from the communique has to do with the overall economic approach to this problem. Fixing the politics is obviously critical, it is vital, it is key, but we also need to be clear as to what should be the direction of the economic policy. I think this is also something that we have mentioned very clearly. And we cannot focus on economic growth alone. We have to look at well-being and all the other, all the other aspects. Uh, redistribution is as important, if not even more important, than growth policies alone. So not just growth, because growth is going to worsen, if it is business as usual, the existing inequalities. So we have to look at redistribution as a very important part. And then, of course, the other point is that we have to have an economy, we have to have growth, which is compatible to us living within planetary boundaries. The whole issue of environment is also, of course, very important. So we need to rethink about our consumption and uh, production patterns in ways that actually promote well-being. So those are the four key messages that I wanted to share with you from the Dhaka communique. And of course, I'll be very happy to answer questions later on. Thank you very much, uh, President Chaudhry. I'll now turn to Martin Chang-Kong, the Secretary General of the IPU. Uh, thank you very much, Paddy. Uh, <clears throat> um, we've just had the President uh, say that parliaments uh, were very much involved in the design of the new development agenda, the Agenda 2030. And uh, it seems to us that after having uh, advocated and articulated the need for uh, parliamentary involvement in the SDGs, now parliaments have to walk the talk at national level because at the end of the day, the international commitments have to go to the national uh, level for uh, implementation. And uh, as the global organization of uh, uh, parliaments, uh, we uh, have uh, been doing our best to make sure that parliaments, wherever they are, are fit for purpose that parliaments are aware of uh, the SDGs and are aware of uh, the implications of the SDGs on the way that business is done at the national level. So um, since the adoption of uh, Agenda 2013, we have striven to do a number of things. Uh, first of all, we have uh, uh, encouraged, uh, reached out to parliaments to try to explain what the SDGs are all about. We have. Uh, developed and implemented a number of uh, regional uh, gatherings, uh, seminars in the various parts of the world to explain the SDGs to uh, parliaments, to b begin to build partnerships between parliaments and other institutions uh, that and stakeholders that are uh, needed for the uh, successful implementation of the SDGs. We use these seminars as uh, a means of building capacity for uh, parliaments for the implementation of the SDGs. And we have also then developed uh, a tool that uh, we call the Self-Assessment uh, Toolkit, which in fact is uh, a small uh, uh, document that we have uh, designed in cooperation with the United Nations Development Program uh, to help parliaments assess their capacity and see whether they are actually fit for purpose, there, whether they can, they are ready to implement the SDGs or at least to contribute to the implementation of the SDGs because at the end of the day, it's not they who do the actual implementation, but they uh, act as facilitators, putting in place the legislative framework, providing the resources that are needed and monitoring implementation, holding government accountable for implementation of the SDGs. So uh, this uh, uh, tool is intended for them to do an assessment of their capacity to perform these functions and identify gaps. And uh, when the gaps are identified, the Interparliamentary Union with its partners, the United Nations Development Program, can come in and help them to block those gaps and make sure that they uh, are in effect uh, available and able to implement, to help implement the SDGs. One of the very first things we did too in the wake of the adoption of the SDGs is to help develop what we call a sample resolution, parliamentary resolution that uh, uh, we encourage parliaments to use uh, uh, to spur debate in on the floor of the House to see how uh, parliaments are beginning to integrate the SDGs, uh, what it is that uh, they are doing 
to ensure that uh, the SDGs become part and parcel of uh, the uh, uh, work of uh, uh, Parliament. And uh, I must say that this uh, resolution has been very popular. It's been used uh, by many parliaments, and we do encourage other parliaments uh, to, to do the same. Uh, again, uh, I have mentioned the issue of assistance, building capacity in parliaments to deal with uh, the SDGs. Uh, now, uh, one major uh, aspect of success in the implementation of the SDGs is accountability, it's monitoring uh, the implementation of the SDGs. And what we are trying to do is to ensure that parliaments are actually part of the accountability mechanisms that are established in countries to follow the, S, uh, the, the implementation of the SDGs. As you all know, the high-level political forum is the institution that has been created within the UN system to monitor implementation of the SDGs. And we're very much keen to have parliaments associated with this mechanism. And we do this in a couple of ways. First of all, we have a committee on UN affairs within the IPU, which is a statutory body of the organization that devotes its spring session to assessing parliamentary involvement in the implementation of the SDGs with a view to feeding the, the findings of these discussions into the uh, proceedings of the high level political forum. We're here for the 2017 uh, version of the uh, high level political forum, and we have just uh, had a, a parliamentary event at uh, the uh, uh, high level political forum. Uh, last year, uh, the last time we met, we had some 40 parliamentarians coming. This year, we, the number has doubled to 80, and we're hoping that the they will grow because it is important that parliamentarians are, 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 are involved in monitoring implementation of the SDGs. And uh, as uh, my colleague uh, Petra will be explaining to you, we have uh, realized that uh, parliaments have been alive and kicking when it comes to the uh, implementation of the SDGs. In fact, uh, uh, although uh, we sent out a survey and uh, we had very little feedback on parliamentary involvement. What we were hearing during the uh, discussions that took place a couple of days ago was that, uh, in fact, parliaments are moving, they are creating structures, they are adapting their working methods to uh, uh, suit the SDG uh, 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 agenda. And uh, we think that it is something that is an example of good practice that we need to encourage. And of course, again, as the global organization of parliaments, we consider the SDGs as a golden opportunity for uh, parliaments to continue to prove that they are relevant to society. It is a framework that has been agreed globally. It has uh, global support, and it is there. Uh, uh, it's comprehensive, and so members of parliaments, parliaments as the representative institutions of the people, uh, have the bounden duty to ensure the success of this new global agenda that uh, the world has given itself uh, in order to continue to deliver on the expectations and interests of the people and to live up to the uh, motto or slogan of the SDGs, leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. And now we'll hear from uh, Petra Baer specifically uh, about the panel and the practical examples that were shared on Monday night. Petra? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, it's of course, it's great to see that 18, 80 parliamentarians are attending this year's HLPF. Uh, many of them also attended our, our parliamentary side event, which was on the contribution of MPs um, real, realizing uh, the SDGs and implementing them. And I think that it really was a very good proof to see that this DACA communique is not only lip service, but really transformed by parliamentarians into real life, into policy. And for instance, we learned from Mali that they just uh, decided on a law that uh, includes more women into voting lists, which of course guarantees that also women are involved in uh, decision-making processes, which is very keen for equality, of course. We learned, for instance, from Peru that the parliament initiated a, a new approach how to measure poverty. And it's not only anymore the, the GDP which counts, but it's a multi-dimensional uh, question of how 
poverty is measured and that of course reaches much more people and can be much more sensitive in tackle this problem. We learned from Ecuador um, that their parliamentarians put the when we were the good life for everybody to the center of each policy and each policy must meet this goal to improve lives of people. And we also learned, for instance, from Jordan that they are very much struggling for uh, methods and ideas how they can make the uh, budget more SDG sensitive so that it really will reach the goals. Uh, uh, Great Britain uh, still has a legal obligation to spend 0.7% of their cross-national um, uh, um, money uh, for ODA, for official development assistance, to contribute for a more balanced economic uh, 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 distribution of the world. And we also learned from Liberia and Honduras that they just passed laws to forbid child marriage, which of course uh, means that many more girls will stay in school, many more girls will have then later on the chance to get paid work, which is a basis for self-determined living, and which also means that the, the number of um, uh, teenage pregnancies will, will go down. And we know that teenage pregnancies still are the number one cause for deaths among girls between 15 and 18. We also heard from uh, Spain that despite the fact that they have really um, heavy budget uh, <coughs> constraints, um, that they still uh, deliver free services on edu basic education and, and health services for everybody, uh, also to, to foster trust of people in institutions and into the state. And I also can tell you from Austria, for instance, where we struggle for a more fair and more balanced tax system that um, goes the way that to increase taxation for money that you inherit and decrease um, taxation for, for income that comes from labor force. So if we look at all these examples, and it's just a few out of them, there were lots of contributions in our side event, um, then we see that MPs all over the world are really working um, to make the place, make their countries a fairer place and have a fairer distribution of wealth, of access to public goods, of individual opportunities, and also to paid work as one of the key fun fundamentals for self-determinated lives. Um, we know that equitable societies, and we know that from many scientific studies, that equitable societies um, cause better lives for everybody, the rich and the poor, mm -hmm. um, concerning to, uh, to health, to social uh, interaction, and many, many more items. And um, a well-balanced society, such a well-balanced world, and of course this is also one of the, of the SDGs, um, is the really thing that can guarantee lives in dignity, in peace, and in health for everybody. And the International Parliamentary Union is trying to contribute to this big goal. Terrific. Thank you very much, um, Piber. I wonder if there are any questions. Um, sir, could you please say where you're calling from as well? Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, Joseph Klein of Canada Free Press. You, you uh, uh, Ms. Bayer uh, enumerated uh, the contributions of a number of countries. Uh, I'm wondering whether you have any comment or any of you have any comment on the record of the United States and in particular um, since uh, President Trump took office and has there been any representation by the U.S. Uh, Congress um, you know, at, at these meetings and if you can give us a sense of if so uh, what their uh, contribution, if any, has been. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's early days yet. Uh, the uh, President Trump's administration has been around for uh, seven months now, and uh, uh, I must say that uh, it has not been. We have not had very much interaction with the U.S. Congress since. Uh, his arrival, uh, since the arrival of uh, President uh, uh, Trump. Uh, we have had some uh, engagement with individual members of Congress, and uh, but uh, not at a very formal level. We are hopeful that uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months, we can uh, reach some uh, more substantive engagement with uh, 
the uh, with uh, the U.S. Congress. That would be the uh, uh, interlocutor of the Interparliamentary Union in these affairs. To be clear, they're not currently a member of the Interparliamentary Union. They were a founding member in 1889, and we're working to have them re-engage. Sir. Thank you. Thank you all for this uh, presentation. I have a couple of questions to uh, President Chaudhary. I noticed that you said the IPU for the first time is tackling inequality. Why has it waited until now to do that? And second, you indicated that in order to vanquish poverty, you have to go to deep root causes of it, including structural inequality. One of the flagrant uh, situations of inequality visible is the Security Council. What role does the parliamentary, interparliamentary union play in reforming the council? Thank you. No, yeah. Let me, let me start with the first question. Um, inequality, of course, is a cross-cutting issue. You know, there are a number of issues which, when you consider, also have dimensions of inequality. What I was saying is, for the first time in, um, in recent years, um, in the forum of an assembly, we have considered this as a theme for the general debate. Um, and this was in direct response to the SDGs, and in particular, Goal 10. And we consider this to be a very important goal. So uh, the SDGs have only been around for two years now. So we didn't have a chance to place this discussion in context of the SDGs earlier. But I think when we have talked about poverty, you know, when we have talked about rule of law, uh, when we have talked about inclusive parliaments, the fact that parliaments have to be microcosm of the societies that they represent, we were really addressing the aspect of inequality. And uh, of course, structural, I mean, the main point there is that we have to look at the root causes, the drivers of poverty. And I think this is something that the IPU has tried to bring in all of the issues that it uh, responds to. So when we talk about, for instance, uh, because it's a topical subject and I'm bringing it out as an example, when we talk about violent extremism, we have moved the debate from countering violent extremism to preventing violent extremism. So countering is more of the security response, whereas when you talk about prevention, you're trying to identify what are the root drivers of terrorism. So I think here also we are trying to bring this in. And of course, when you talk about poor people, uh, they are disadvantaged in terms of access to domestic global markets, in terms of access to finance, uh, in terms of access to uh, representation in parliament. So I think, you know, we are talking about uh, what we as parliamentarians can do, uh, and there's no point in trying to duplicate what others are doing. So we try and focus on areas where we can actually bring value to the table rather than repeating what others are doing. So we talk about strengthening of legal frameworks. We talk about making parliaments more open, more accessible, more inclusive. Uh, we talk about listening to the concerns of the people that we represent, because representation is a very important part of the function that we have. We talk about making the economy work as a whole for all the people, or not just for a certain section. So I think those are the, are the various uh, dimensions that we talk about when we look at the structuralist approach, which is different from the traditional approach. So no, don't look at the symptoms, look at the root causes. What was the other question? I think. Yeah, it was about whether we've had debates uh, discussing changing to the, the Security Council. Uh, the Security Council is, you know, we are not directly involved because it is the governments that are involved. But uh, there have been discussions within the IPU. You know, parliamentarians, of course, have views on various things. and. We have tried to present the current status of the of the uh, of the discourse. You know what are the various suggestions. We try and keep our parliamentarians advised on that, and we then encourage them to take it up with the respective governments. Thank you, sir. Sure, thanks a lot. Uh, Matthew Lee, Inner City Press. Thanks a lot for the briefing. I wanted to. They've been emphasizing a lot during these, these few days these voluntary national reports by countries. And there was an, a, in this room, there were some complaints by indigenous groups, but also other civil society groups that they weren't really able to, to kind of comment on, on the reports that countries were putting in. 
or, or in fact, they had to submit questions in advance, and some were selected and some weren't, so they felt it was kind of a pre-screening process. I wanted to, maybe you can say, what is in the reports that are being presented this time around? Are they entirely by the executive branches of these countries, or is there some procedure, I guess, for parliaments to, 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 to maybe be a bridge between, you know, the actual electorate or, or civil society? Uh, I guess just, if, just your, your thoughts on that, if, if you've seen these reports and how they're presented. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I, I think that the process that was put in place for the fashioning of the SDGs uh, should also be uh, uh, the same process that would be used for monitoring the implementation of the SDGs, which means that uh, you would want broad-based consultations, you would want multi-stakeholder uh, initiatives and mechanisms put in place involving a cross-section of society, being the exec executive, the judiciary, the parliament, and uh, you know, you, you talk of the, uh, those groups, uh, the minorities and the generous people, everybody coming to the table to articulate their interests and uh, explaining how these interests are being taken into account in the implementation of the SDGs, that the ideal world. But we are not yet there. And if I can speak for Parliament, I can say that, uh, yes, there is a lot of progress that has to be made in involving Parliament in the national review process. Uh, at this session of the HLPF, we have 44 countries presenting uh, national reports. And uh, what we did was what we normally do uh, with major UN processes. That is, we reached out to the parliaments of the countries involved to alert them to this particular process of uh, national reviews and to uh, seek their views and information on whether or not they were involved in the in the process. And uh, the results are not very encouraging. We received uh, uh, information that, uh, that only nine countries, nine parliaments reported having been, in a way, informed of the process. And of those nine, three actually said that they had been involved in the drafting of the national report. So there is uh, a long way to go. For us, uh, our goal is to ensure that for each national report, there is full-fledged parliamentary involvement. And I've just come from having a meeting with the UNDP administrator, and I believe that we are agreed that at national level, country-level dialogue processes that are put in place should involve a cross-section of society including parliaments, not only governments, because generally uh, when you talk of the executive arm, they're preaching among the converted. You have to reach to other segments of society to get their views uh, and uh, factor these views into the reports and the reviews that are being presented at the international level in terms of uh, fulfilling commitments that are taken at the international level, in this particular case, the Agenda 2030. To add something first? Uh, just to add, uh, on the one hand, I of course also had the complaints and talked with NGOs about that. And I understand the, the, the idea to have very short time for questions, because if you want to raise the questions, you can do it in one or two minutes as well as in ten. And I think it's worth the time to do it shorter. But of course, what is really crazy to post the report, the questions in advance. I cannot, I cannot know what I should ask, even in my parliament, for instance, if I ask my minister what I should ask before what I know what he will say. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is crazy. And what I also would like to, um, to point out is, um, um, compared to the last HLPF, there was no space for parliamentarians at the official, uh, at the whole two weeks this time. Not, not one parliamentarian on the podium, one German parliamentary secretary of state, but that's maybe not a real parliamentarian, to be honest. Um, even not uh, a parliamentarian having a lead question. So I think that is really very a poor performance. And if we want to have parliamentarians visible in the whole process of implementing the SDGs, then also the ECOSOC should um, be more active on, on involving parliamentarians, I would say. Yeah, just if I may add to what uh, the Secretary General mentioned, um, if you look at a, a still picture, at this moment in time, it's not very encouraging. But I think uh, if you look at the, uh, the engagement of parliamentarians globally, you know, the increased engagement, the fact that they are much more plugged into the SDGs than they were to the MDGs, the fact that we were involved in the in the articulation in the formulation of the SDGs, 
I think there is a far greater interest uh, amongst parliamentarians. And also you have to remember that this is a process and it will take time to reach the level that we would like it to reach. Uh, for instance, if I talk about my own country, Bangladesh, you know, one of the questions we looked at is, okay, so the parliamentarians <clears throat> are going to work with the government to try and see what they can do with the report. But then the government is, you know, it's a huge sprawling bureaucracy. So I think identifying a focal point within the government for SDGs is going to be very important so that parliaments can then interact with that individual. So that process has started, for instance, in Bangladesh, where a very senior civil servant under the prime minister's office has been tasked with the responsibility. So now we don't have to run to 45 or 50 ministries. You know, we can go to just one person. So I think that is laying the foundations for greater parliamentary engagement in the future, which I think is positive. The other aspect is, um, of course, uh, partnerships are going to be critical in terms of implementing the SDGs. And when we talk about partners, the private sector, the civil society, the non-governmental organizations are all very important. But what sets parliaments apart from the rest is the fact that we are constitutionally mandated. You know, this is a mandate that the constitution in each country gives us. I think it's taking a while for this to sink in. Uh, with a lot of uh, agencies, but I think increasingly it is so, and we are getting there. So hopefully when we have the third uh, high-level political forum, uh, the number will probably go from 9 to, I don't know, 19 or 20 or 25. Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, un under the um, item improving international cooperation in the communique, um, there's a bullet that says, advocate for a fairer representation of the interests of developing countries in the institutions of global economic and financial governance. So I'd like you to drill down a little bit on this, um, whether this is suggesting a fundamental reform or even replacement of um, institutions like the IMF, World Bank, and also whether, as has been proposed actually uh, several years ago at the UN in a high-level meeting, the G7 and the G20 be replaced by effectively the G193. Um, you know, all the members of the UN uh, to allow uh, a much broader level of participation and uh, inputs into um, global economic uh, policy making. So, could you comment on on that? Is that what uh, the authors of this document had in mind with that item? Um, I was actually present when this part of the debate was, being, uh, was going through. Um, I think the idea is that there is a sense among parliamentarians that we need to have a more inclusive global governance. You know, when we as parliamentarians talk about governance, it's always at the national level. But the international governance is also becoming increasingly important. And so whether it is the World Bank or whether it is the IMF, um, we didn't go to the radical point that you're suggesting that we replace all these organizations. But I think in terms of decision making, uh, there is a general feeling that it has to be more representative. Um, it shouldn't just be a few countries, but there should be more general representation. But we didn't get to the point where we said that it has to be all the 193 countries or no specific proposals were talked about in that regard. But uh, I think this is a communique and what we do with the communique after a general debate it is then circulated to all the national parliaments. And then they will, in turn, have their own discussions. So I think this is going to be something that is going to be ongoing. And uh, we will probably be revisiting this when we have the next assembly or a future assembly that we will uh, discuss these things. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I, one of the strategic objectives of the IPU is to bridge the democracy gap in international decision making. And this is a recognition of the fact that those institutions that have been put in place at the global, regional, international level in general are not functioning according to the principles of democracy, which include 
uh, for participation by all in decision-making processes. The outcomes are not sufficiently representative of the interests of the people. And we advocate the involvement of parliaments as the foremost representative institutions in countries. And as the president just said, the uh, parliaments are vested with uh, the uh, powers to represent the people. This is something that is in the constitutions of most countries in the world. And so we have been advocating for parliaments to be at the table uh, where decisions are being uh, made, not because they want to usurp the role that uh, is incumbent on the executive arms of government, because they are the, the governments that negotiate treaties and international commitments. But when it comes to country-level implementation, most often the first port of call is parliaments, because parliaments are called upon then to ratify or cause ratification of these international agreements. And if they have not been involved in the uh, discussions leading up to those commitments, how can they be allies of the government at national level for implementation? So it's important that uh, we begin to close this democracy gap in uh, decision making at the international level. It is very good, I think, for more positive outcomes at national level. It makes for greater cooperation between the various arms of government in the implementation of international commitments. So yes, from that point of view, it is important that various stakeholders be at the table. And the SDGs, the process for the uh, formulation of the SDGs is a good one. You, you need not create a, an institution that will reflect that, but you need to change processes in the existing institutions to make sure that they are more open, they are more consultative in their approach if you want to achieve outcomes that are more representative of the views of the global community. Thank you. And final comment to uh, Petra? Yeah, I would go one step further and say there is a lack of economic democracy, especially. If we look, for instance, at the Bretton Woods Institution, which you mentioned, um, then we see that the ongoing debate for centuries now about the composition of the voting groups, about the composition of the voting rights and, and mights are, is, are not satisfying at all. So uh, I think there is still a lot to do. And I also um, um, really support the idea of, of uh, developing countries when they claimed uh, around last the year before uh, in 15 uh, the, the debate around uh, financing for development uh, um, conference three in Addis Abeba where they demand a, a, a tax body under the ECOSOC because of course it's their interest to, to share experience and to have a common approach on tax policy which uh, avoids illicit flows out of the countries and if we take it serious and say that domestic resource mobilization is really an important thing then of course, there should be such a body where you can decide also about economic economic uh, questions more more in direction of hard law than in in, in in beautiful languages as you do it now at the moment only. Okay, sorry, I've, I'm, we're going to be um, uh, asked to leave shortly. I'll just have a quick question from you and hopefully quick responses. Yes, and Charles Baltic Review. In redressing in inequalities, what can you tell us about the role of women as members of the inter-parliamentary union, particularly in the Scandinavian countries and the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania? Uh, Martin? Yeah. Well, uh, this gender equality in uh, uh, parliaments or in politics is one area where I think we have something to show for we uh, published, we've just published the 2017 uh, map on women's uh, participation in parliaments around the world. And uh, those countries that you named, the uh, Baltic and the Nordic countries, are doing extremely well when it comes to uh, gender representation, women's representation in parliaments. And uh, I think Sweden and Finland are uh, among the top 10 in, uh, in the world when it comes to women's uh, political representation at the level of parliament. So that's fine. But within the IPU itself, we have uh, sought to walk the talk. We have uh, an institution that has been established within the IPU to steer our work on gender equality and it's a forum of women parliamentarians that has been there, I think, 40 years now. And uh, they, they have been robust in institutionalizing political representation within the IPU, making sure that women are represented in the various structures of the organization, promoting women's rights in countries where these rights are being uh, challenged, and 
We are now moving on to uh, fighting what we call violence against women politicians, because this is a big deterrent for, uh, in women's political representation. In many parts of the world, women uh, are intimidated. They are the subject of violent uh, threats or actually real violence when they venture into uh, territory that is considered to be male-dominated. So uh, all of these things are on the agenda of the IPU, and we believe that uh, you cannot really talk about democracy, you cannot even talk about development if there is no gender equality, if outcomes are not reflective of uh, the varying uh, uh, interests of men and women in society in, uh, in a manner that is equitable. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin Chungong. Thank you, thank you Petra Baer, and thank you, President Chaudhry. I'll uh, remind you that uh, this document, the Self-Assessment Toolkit, is available in four languages on our website, so people can download that. Um, we also have a study of the sexual harassment of women MPs around the world that's there, and a copy of our map, which documents the percentage of women that are elected in each country and in uh, that are represented in the executive of each country. So if you need any help with that, please, we'll give you our cards. And uh, we thank you for coming today and to all of you for your engagement and to the uh, process. Thank you.